Welcome, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, and, and I really want to, um, you know, just invite you to sit back and, and relax and um, really listen to some great points and, and some new research we have about Elder Care 101. My name is Wendy Walner. I'm thrilled to be here today on behalf of Anthem, and really want to thank you again for just choosing to spend some time with us. You know, this is such an amazingly interesting topic in that um, I've been doing uh, wellness trainings, if you will, for about the past 25 years. And I think one of the biggest changes we've seen is in the whole field of elder care. And so the awesome, great news that we all know is that we are living longer. Um, and so, you know, elder, the age, of course, as I grow, the age grows too, right? So, you know, we're looking at people that are living and, and active and wonderful in their 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, we had a runner at the New York City Marathon who I believe was 91 years old. And the kickoff is she didn't actually start running until she was in her 60s. So elder care is a definitely a different topic than we might think of. Many of us are also in what we call a sandwich generation where maybe we have children and elderly, and elderly uh, people that we take care of. And the other thing that we need to understand is that as it does change, so do we, and we have to remember that we want to take care of ourselves at the same time. So when we go through this presentation, I really want you to think about how well you're doing with all the different buckets you have in your life. And so, you know, elder care is totally encompassing. You know, my dad passed away three years ago, and I um, live a mile from my mom. And, you know, when I first started, it was just about where she lived. It was just, okay, let's move her near me. This is awesome. I can walk to her house. You know, it's perfect, right? It's close, but it's not too close. Perfect. And then as life has changed, we've realized that that's just one bucket that she needs to be worried about and, and, and I need to be worried about. And so clearly, what does the house look like? How long can they stay in that house? One of the most common wishes for our elderly today, which is, of course, not always possible, is to live in their home and not to be moved. And clearly, you can see why that might be complicated, how they get around what towns they live on, live in makes a big difference with what transportation is available to them. Um, and that big, big one, money, and we're not going to delve too deep into that. We have entire classes about financial, but really understanding that elder care abuse um, and elder care scams is the highest it's ever been in this country. Um, I'm going to tell a one-minute uh, example just from this morning. So it's not uncommon that hospitals can get hacked into. This is just such a sad story. And so mom and dad or whoever, aunt and uncle, was in the hospital, they're home, they get a phone call, hi, I'm pretending to be from the hospital, I see you were discharged, I just need your social security number. The elderly person believing that, uh, you know, person, phone scammer, gives her social, and you can imagine what terrible things can happen next, their identity can be stolen. And so... We really need to take care of and understand financial, what does the elder care, elderly person need, what do we want them to know, what do we need to teach them, and, and I, I could go on and on about this, also tell you that, you know, if you think about it from their point of view, you know, they grew up in a time where there were no, 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 no cell phones. And so that whole knowledge of technology, internet, it really, really is complicated for an elderly person, um, taking care of themselves, their house, Definitely understanding depression in older people, which is so common, which of course means counseling at some times, and end-of-life care. Um, and I know you have some up-and-coming webs that are going to talk about that. So you can see what an exhaustive topic we are here to talk about today, right? It is all of these things um, together. And we do need to start with a, a guideline. So very often clients will say to me, well, I don't know. I don't know if my parent is old. And sometimes they'll say, "Well, what is old?" And I know we age, but age it really goes by great slide for you to think about. You know, how independent is the elderly person? You know, I've seen elderly people in their 60s, and I've seen them in the hundreds. So, you know, can they dress, can they undress, can they go to the bathroom, then they get in and out of bed. And I mean regularly, you know, do you worry about falls? This winter was brutal for some of us. Are you worried about them walking outside to get the newspaper? Um, you know, you can de dig, 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 dig deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, do they leave the stove on? Um, do they leave the water running? Um, can they take medications on their own? Um, and 
not only can they use a telephone, but, you know, do they have it with them? Number one place an elderly person uh, falls is the bathroom. And so it can be a very, very, very important. I, I, you know, it's one of the things I, I insist with my mom. She's got a cordless phone, and there is one in the bathroom. So, you know, I think that's just good for anybody, actually. I use it for my own kids as well um, because we know that the bathroom floors are slippery and anybody can fall. Um, you know, when you start to see decisions that don't make sense to you, we want us to understand the, the needs of an older person as quickly as possible. So we're really, 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 really trying to get a very early assessment if that's possible. And this is a good guideline for us to look at to say, okay, let, let me take a step back and see how independent is the older person. You know, on a one to ten, how many of these do they get yeses, how many do they get maybes, and how many do they get noes. And that assessment is going to help you decide how to go forward. Um, this is a fascinating slide, if you've uh, ever heard of it. It's a fairly new role in this country, um, and it's really uh, you know, a, new, a new profession, if you would, um, and the reason is we're very busy. And so for many of us that are working moms or wor you know, working dads or working aunts or uncles, whatever it would be, we might need help. And um, these geriatric case managers are trained to help you. So they're, they're soup to nuts. So you can hire them at an hourly rate, and they can come one time and give you their professional opinion, or they can make an entire plan for the rest of the older person's life, and everything in between. Um, one thing I want to talk about, and it's kind of off topic, but I think it's very relevant, is the geriatric case manager is also going to assess you as the caregiver. And there are some really, really scary statistics about caregivers, and you know, if you're a a full-time caregiver, we have seen huge, huge concerns of that caregiver getting sick um, the following year um, after someone passes away. So the geriatric cast manager is going to be able to say to you, you need a night out, you need some time away, you need some distance, you need some breathing space. Um, you know, caregiving for an older person, and especially if there's any kind of dementia or Alzheimer's, it is exhausting. Um, caregiving for someone who's dying is emotional and exhausting. And so these case managers come in, and as you can see from the slide, and I don't want to read from the slide, they really make a plan. And some of it's going to include a, a really a clear view of what you can and cannot do. Um, and um, it's really important that that independent person comes in. I, I can tell you on a personal note, uh, when I was taking care of my dad, um, I remember the case manager coming in and saying, um, you're really burned out. You need an entire day off. And, you know, my dad was near the end of his life, and I was really resistant to hearing it. And um, she really pushed me on that. And I have to tell you, uh, I, I can't even tell you, I didn't realize it until I went home. I took a long bubble bath. I went for a walk. I had a, a home meal. Um, everything changed from one day off. And so you can be in the thick of the woods and not realize it. So you also want to make sure that you are the kind of person that can advocate for your loved one. And let's be honest, some of us are just stronger and some of us are not. And so this is a personal slide about how much help you might want during this time. It also varies. You know, I've seen some clients who have Alzheimer's uh, 20 years. 20 years they've needed care, and I've seen some that are two years. So, you know, everything depends upon your individual situation. We really want to make sure you know that there are so many choices out there, um, so many different supports to help us through the process. Um, and that's critically important that you feel you found the right one. Um, the same thing with, you know, caring uh, for older people where they live. You know, I tell you that, you know, my, my mom and many clients do not want to move from their home. You know, they are, they are very, very, very creature of habits. Hey, so am I. I get it. But it got to a place where I couldn't take care of her home and my house. And so I needed some other options. And what was amazing to me and totally empowering was how many options there were. 
And so we got a really good chance. And, you know, this is an awesome thing for all of us to do, to have a sense of what's out there. They look and feel very different than they did a few years ago. Um, I'll tell you an interesting story. As a business person, there's a host- there was a hotel upstate New York, and it wasn't doing very well. Um, it was having a really hard time, and it actually switched over to an assisted living, and there's now a waiting list of years to get in. So, you know, for some of us, assisted living is a wonderful choice, and I just want to explain that alternative housing, you can have assisted living, which is really almost like a hotel, where they do very, very, very little um, other than that there's meals made. And then you can have assisted living, which really does everything for you and everything in between. And so you want to make sure that you can go and visit different places. Um, I also really suggest that you get in touch with your United Way chapter. I I really strongly suggest that you look at what your community resources have. Um, Community colleges and and colleges both have wonderful senior centers. Uh, I have a lot of clients who are taking classes. These are all free, um, and they take these. They're called collegiums, and um, they have transportation to and from. It is an awesome resource, and it's a wonderful use of our tax dollars. So it's really something to take advantage of. Um, And they usually use the range of 55 and over. So these senior centers are vastly different than that picture on the right, right? That is the traditional hospital, very sterile. Clearly, sometimes you need to go there. Um, We try to keep our ourselves and our elderly people out of that hospital, but there's certainly all of these different resources, and, you know, we want to make sure that we know about them. We really want to understand that, and, you know, if I pick and choose from this list, you know, one thing that's important about uh, a personal emergency response system, and that's really that bracelet or the necklace that you push the button, Um, and for some people it's really important Maybe it's uh, for a family that's not nearby. Um, They want to make sure that that person has, or maybe they're unstable on their feet, and so that they give them a bracelet. And I I can tell you sometimes we've organized that for families for Christmas because there is a monthly charge, um, and it does immediately call 911 as well as the backup uh, person. So it, it can be a really, really good peace of mind. One of the suggestions I have that's not on here is that you should always have a neighbor's phone number. Um, I do think it's important to just be able to say it's just too bad weather. You know, I'm a mile from my mom, and I learned this winter, I can't always get by. A mile doesn't matter. I mean, if it's a blizzard, I can't go a mile. So I want to make sure if I can't reach my mom, I have a neighbor to call. Um, Love things like Peapod grocery deliver. What's interesting to remember in, in, in the elderly, they don't do home delivery, right? That, their generation did not call up and have pizzas delivered. Um, and so sometimes we need to teach them these things and show them how they work um, and explain it to them. So very important. Same thing with cleaning services. You know, it's, it's a very individual choice. And one of the things that's important to nip in the bud is, you know, some of us have heard that as they get older, they become more like the child and you become like, more like the parent. And I, I want to tell you, we don't believe that. They're still the matriarch and patriarch. And so until the day they pass away and afterwards, their respect is as an older person that's been around longer. And so we might need to coach them on different ideas, but cleaning services is something very many are resistant to, um, either for financial reasons or pride or just they don't want people touching their stuff. And I think we have to be very respectful of what we can push on them and what we can't push on them. Um, And certainly we just want to give you a lot of choices here, right? And this is a great list um, to, to look at and say, okay, am I aware of what they're Uh, involved in and there's always a senior center to go to and there's usually a United Way that's a clearinghouse that will tell you everything in your community. Now if we go if we drill down right there are people who need help and that's the the real extreme of custodial care and I want to I want to we do recommend that if you go to visit someone and the water is running the um, stove is on, um, something is dangerous, 
right? They need custodial care. Um, we really do feel pretty strongly that you don't want to take second chances on that. We, it's an intervention. It doesn't feel good. I've done it. Um, one client had left the stove on, um, and the smell of gas was very strong, and she was very argumentative about staying in her house, and it was a really, really difficult decision. But when people are taking not just their own lives at risk, we need to intervene. The same thing, by the way, is true with the driver's license. Um, our recommendation with the driver's license is to involve the, the doctor, and uh, a good gerontologist will help you, if you will, be the bad guy, right? So when I took away my grandmother's uh, driver's license, it was the doctor who actually gave the message, and I was there. So I had called the doctor. We had done a talk about why I was concerned about her driving, um, and we moved on from, from there. And so custodial care is when someone needs a lot of help. Um, they need a, the active activities of daily living. And then we go down from there, right? So we have a companion care. And a companion care is very important because we are worried, very worried that older people are happy. And you know what? Being alone, maybe they're a recent widow, maybe they, you know, their, their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren have grown up, and they're really alone. And so depression and loneliness are huge concerns to us. And so a companion care can really help with that. So they not just help with this, you know, errands and cooking hard-boiled eggs, but they also become friends. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of unusual friendships in my years of doing this, so it's just a chemistry thing. And you may have to go through ten companions before you find the right one. You know, the last part is all of the skilled care. So... There is a lot of debate about how often uh, an older person should go to the doctor and how many checkups, and, and I'm not here to pass judgment on. I'm here to say you want to have people in your life, from doctors to nurses to any kind of therapist, who can give you the information you want. We work with um, COPD, such a huge issue, right? It's a pulmonary disease. It's very common if you've ever smoked in your life, but it's also common maybe if you're overweight. There are a lot of different issues with COPD. And, you know, we know that there's many things you can do that really help with COPD, and one of them is simply walking. You know, the ability to walk, the ability to be mobile for an older person is huge. Every time I'm in a mall or shopping or on, in, on an airplane, I'm always thinking, boy, this would be challenging if I couldn't walk. And so we're trying to keep older people walking as much as possible, and that's the idea of physical therapy. Um, I love, I love any kind of yoga, any kind of water therapy, um, water yoga, um, anything in the water which is very low impact really, really keeps muscle tone and balance for older people. And those are wonderful things to look at. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the insurances reimburse for that today because it's so effective. We also want to talk about the places to live, right? We talked about some of these and people move between them. We're actually seeing a pretty interesting trend where we see uh, one facility have both an assisted living and a long-term care. Not uncommon to see that where, you know, they'll be for the first, uh, first part, the first level, maybe floors one and two are assisted living, and then levels three and four are uh, long-term care facilities. So that's something to look at that may be um, exciting for you. Um, retirement communities, I often joke, I, sometimes I'll visit them, and they're over 55, and I'm like, man, this just looks awesome. The meals are made, there's golfing, and, you know, there's a whole uh, community centers, and there's drama clubs and book clubs and um, uh, uh, workshops and tons of stuff going on. So I think one thing that's important is that you really do have to go out and look, and I, I do think that there are some really amazing, and of course when you're going to the subacute, the really, really serious, maybe the Alzheimer's ward, um, which is really, you know, for people that have really do not have any more knowledge of where they are. There's such a touching story, I don't know if you've heard it, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is our Supreme Court judge, of course, and her husband is at a subacute um, uh, home, and he has very, very serious Alzheimer's. And she, he has no idea who she is. And on the last visit uh, a few months ago, he said to 
to, to his wife, I'd like to introduce you to my new girlfriend. And she talked about the fact that she does still visit her husband. She goes to see her husband, and she hangs out with this girlfriend because that's in the moment, and that's what he knows. And she's come to terms with the reality is that he doesn't remember anything about her. And so, you know, that is a very touching story of love and commitment and understanding of how old age can affect us. They're exactly the same age. She's still on the Supreme Court judge, and he has uh, total Alzheimer's. So, you know, it, the, the, the gamut is just so true. Um, this is a peace of mind slide. Uh, I just finished this for myself. Um, I actually have a, a very strong opinion that everyone from the age of 16 up should have these three documents. I pick 16 because usually you start to drive then. Um, a living will changes all of the time. Um, very, very important to understand that, that you know, a living will is exactly what it sounds like. As of this moment in time, this is what I feel. Um, this is what I know. Um, power of attorney for most laws, for most states, excuse me, has changed. And so you've got to pick your power of attorney very, very carefully. Um, it's got to be someone that is going to make tough decisions very quickly. And that healthcare proxy is the person that really explains everything. And, you know, I'm going to oversimplify it because you see that disclaimer at the bottom. We are, we are asking you to seek the advice of an elder care, uh, elder law attorney because it's incredibly important to know it's complicated. But I'll give you an example of a healthcare proxy. Generally speaking, you have two choices. So if you are brain dead, right, your brain is showing no movement at all, but your heart is beating, do you want to be kept alive? That's called brain death, right? Your brain is totally not functioning, but your heart is. And the reverse, if your heart has stopped functioning, but your brain is going, do you want to be kept alive? And these are the decisions that need to be stipulated, and your power of attorney says, yes, I get it. I can do that. I mean, in my family, uh, I have three kids, all grown, all old, um, and they've already said that only my son could do it. Um, and so you really have to have some discussions here about what your wishes are um, and will the person be able to do that. With a do not resuscitate, uh, a tip that we usually recommend is if the older person is living at home and does have a DNR, it actually should be on their refrigerator. It should be very easily accessed because when you call 911, if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, if they don't find that DNR right away, they will resuscitate you. It is their job. So I know this is a pleasant conversation, but I have to tell you, you will sleep better at night. You will really understand these decisions. And it's always easy to make it now when it's calm. You know, I sit down, I'm my mom's power of attorney, nice cup of chamomile tea. She's very well right now, and we have a discussion. It's not stressful. What's stressful is if they're in a car accident or they've fallen or something terrible has happened and I have no clue what to do. And we don't want that to happen to you or to anybody. Money. Money is the, you know, big elephant in the room here. And so, you know, you have a ton of different options. You know, maybe you've done a really, really, really good job and you've got your bank account and that's what we mean by self-pay. And you say, you know what, I can hire anybody I want. I'm going to pay cash. Green. Good old-fashioned, that's awesome, certainly a possibility. Maybe you have bought some long-term care insurance over the years. Um, certainly a lot of debate. Um, I'm not here to pass judgment. It is a possibility. It is fairly expensive. Um, what, what I would tell you about the long-term care is we do want you to understand where it is applicable. So not every assisted living takes long-term care. Not every... Um, a uh, hospital, you know, uh, uh, or a uh, Alzheimer's ward takes long-term care. So, you know, you do want to understand what you're buying, and you really want to make sure that, um, really, truly, that you can um, make sure you understand how long it's for. Make sure you understand all of the different, uh, you know, things of what it does and doesn't cover, because every plan is a little different. And then, of course, you've got all of your insurance um, benefits next. And one of them is Medicare, Medicaid. Um, you know that this is all changing, so clearly what you do want to know is what is covered and what's not covered. And, you know, this is true for everyone in healthcare today. We need to be empowered to ask. 
We need to be empowered to say, you know, can I appeal the decision? Am I, is, it, is it universal? You've got this Medigap. Some people call it a donut hole. And so all of those are very individual and is make sure that you know for you and your mom, your dad, whoever it would be. Um, I've had clients call up and, and they, they really will say, can I go here? Can I do this? So we're seeing a lot of urgent cares. Um, crop up all over America. You know, it's kind of the answer to the um, to the emergency room situation. And some are covered and some are not covered. So make sure you know that. Um, you also want to make sure if you are a veteran or anyone in your family is part of the veterans, many of them do have veterans' homes um, that are accessible for you. There's also funeral benefits. That's very important. Um, you know, funerals today in this country go between ten and fifteen thousand dollars, and you know, talk about an awkward conversation, right? Um, usually, you're making it very quickly. People make very, very, very big financial decisions. I give you a, a really daunting uh, thing to think about. You know, if you want to have a certain memorial service and you want to have the body there in the coffin, you can be spending thousands of dollars more, which is fine, of course, if that's what you want to do. But we're empowering you to have choices. So know your choices. Ask the questions. Be very clear about when the benefits work and when they don't work. Um, when to start collecting Social Security. Um, I've had incredibly good luck working with the uh, Social Security office, so I've actually found them incredibly responsive for clients. You can get them on the phone. And the other interesting thing is their, their websites are excellent. So I know it has a, a not such a great reputation, but there's a wealth of information about what you can and cannot do on Social Security and Medicare. The Center for uh, Medicare, C CMS, is excellent. We really, really, really urge you to understand that um, there's a saying, right, growing old is not for the faint of heart. And it is incredibly important to be sensitive and to be empathetic to people wanting to do it by themselves. And so that is incredibly important. And so, yes, it may be extremely painful, and sometimes it tests your patience. But we really want you to understand that they, that is an incredible part of growing older, and I, I know I'm going to feel the same way. So you want to ask. You don't want to tell. You know, what, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, I've seen people do things that sometimes are a little bit shocking, um, travel, uh, take more, you know, riskier things with their money. And you know what? We really want to be as non judgmental. The only time we say to cross that line is when there's a safety issue. Um, you know, other than that, you know what? Yeah, you may be right. There may be an easier, better, quicker, cheaper way to do something. But hey, guys, that's not what it's about. It really is about, okay, you know what? This is about your life and how you're going. Um, I, I remember I was working in a nursing home uh, a number of years ago, a very traditional nursing home, and the people had a real wish to go on a um, – pilgrimage. They wanted to go to the Middle East. They wanted to do a religious sort of journey. And there was a concern because some of them were older. They were well. Um, they, you know, they were relatively well. And one of the sons came to me and said, you know, I'm really afraid my mother's going to die. And I said, your mother's 84 years old. You know, that's a fear and that's a reality. At 84, yeah, she is going to die. And the reality is she can die with the plan of doing her dream or not. And so we want to be able to have that conversation with them and not be pushy and not be forceful. I've seen way too many sons and daughters thinking they're doing the right thing by pushing their belief system forward, um, you know, and that's incredibly important. My mom is very shy. I'm not, but she is. And so you know what? I respect the fact that she's not going to join certain things. Um, is it frustrating? Of course it's frustrating because I think she would be happier since my dad died. It's not about me. I accept her decisions, I, I understand them, and I don't pass judgment on them. There is so many amazing resources that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I love AARP. I love the articles. I'm going to put a plug out there. I did talk about the Medicare one already. Um, AARP, I find it to be extremely uh, up-to-date. Uh, put it in writing is all the forms that I've talked about that you need, um, and there's, you know, there's many more here. I mean, we're just 
tipping an iceberg on what you can do. The, the last one, of course, is Social Security. I, I will tell you that, you know, this is a time commitment, right? So if you're a caregiver, either for someone or, you're, or me, I'm, I'm getting older, I want to do a little bit of research every day. And so, you know, I always like to hear the new research about, you know, if I eat this food, it may help me prevent certain things. And I think it's interesting. You know, I'm not suggesting that everything is exactly right. Clearly, we know that the best way to keep our balance and our flexibility is to really stay thinner. Um, there is a magic uh, age, though. I just have to tell you this because I think it's interesting. Once you reach 90, the studies all say the same thing. It kind of sort of doesn't matter at all what you do. So, you know, you get to 90 and you can drink more and you can eat more and, you know, we don't see anything. But getting to 90, we'd like you to be thinner. We'd like you to be more, um, it, it, your body to be in better shape. And it's for a very obvious reason. If you're heavier and your heart has to work too much, it's going to affect your circulation and it's going to affect your, um, ultimately, how much blood gets to the brain. Now, we just gave you what I think is wonderful resources, but what's amazing is I'm also here on behalf of Anthem EAP. And so you can absolutely call us seven days a week, 365 days a year, anytime. You can see our website is there, um, and we have all this information and more. And so if you want to personalize, you can clearly give us a call. You can also look at your ID theft pre prevention. I do think it's very important. I'm always concerned about elder care abuse. I mentioned that. I'm sorry, elder abuse. Um, I, I certainly have seen it way too many times. It is just a prime target, prime, prime target. Um, and so we have a lot of the forms for you as well. Um, if you do know someone who's smoking, I really don't care even if they're 80 years old. Any bit that they quit really helps them, and it really, not just long life. You know, I have to tell you, one of our goals is not to live longer. One of our goals here at Anthem is to live help, happier and healthier. And so even at quitting smoking at 80, which people think is silly, actually really does decrease the COPD, and you just breathe better. You just literally feel better. So it's incredibly important to take us up on all of our uh, resources that we have for you. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you have an awesome rest of the day and go home and give whoever is in your family a great big hug. Again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.